Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining us for this webinar, either here live or later on. I know that we have many people uh, from all around the world, and I want to thank all of you from wherever you are for joining us today for this webinar, as well as for all of the other things that, uh, that you share with us. We greatly appreciate all of your, uh, our association with all of you and all of the kind comments that you always send our, our way for, for the work that we do. Uh, give me a second here and let me share some slides and get them up on screen and then we'll begin. Alrighty, so uh, today's webinar topic is on contemporary research on behavioral indicators of deception. And the goal of today's research is, uh, today's webinar is to provide an overview of the, uh, and the past of the past and the current state of the art on research on behavioral indicators of deception. Um, I would love to talk about some practical skills uh, and how we can be better at uh, evaluating truthfulness and detecting deception. However, today's uh, webinar is going to be on the background research to to those kinds of indicators. And uh, another goal I have for today is to provide some background about the science behind the way we approach this very important topic, not only for us, but for so many of you and others in, in the world today. The brief outline of what I've got going will be that I'll start uh, uh, discussing a little bit about the importance of research on deception indicators. And then I'd like to spend some time talking about early research uh, until around 2000, the year 2000, on behavioral indicators of deception. Move from there to talk about contemporary research on indicators of deception. I then want to talk about um, how I understand what indicators are, and then we'll have a brief conclusion after that. So here we go. We'll start with a discussion of the importance of research on deception indicators. And as many of you know, whenever we do research, any scientist will tell you that uh, one needs to start with a definition of the topic that you're studying. And uh, I'm often asked about my definition of deception. And um, even though we're not asked, it's good to get a definition, a working definition out so that we can be on the same page or not, and know that we're not, if that's the case, about what we think of as deception. So he, you, here you see um, here what I understand to be deception. And I think it's a pretty um, common definition of deception that's been used uh, over the years. And again, it's a deliberate attempt to mislead others or give false impressions to others without prior notice. Uh, there are many ways to, to uh, classify deception. Uh, one of the biggest ways are these two categories, lies of omission, where one uh, deliberately misleads others by omitting information, and then lies of commission, which are fabrications. Essentially, cr people create uh, stories to, to fabricate or, or um, provide different kinds of information. And I mentioned this also because, Jeff, just very recently, I had a discussion with somebody about deception who did not consider lies of omission as, uh, as deception and only co considered lies of commission as deception. And it's not whether w one person is right or wrong. I think it's good to know the differences that we have if they exist in our definitions of the co topic that we're talking about, which is why I like to start with this, uh, this definition. And it's especially true for research as well. If, if we didn't do have a definition, we couldn't do research uh, or we couldn't do research with the precision that it, it deserves. And talking about the importance of research on deception indicators, of course, one important reason why this is that we do this is to validate possible behavioral indicators. All one needs to do any today and anytime is to go on the internet and search for what people think are indicators of, of deception. There's a lot of, of, uh, of information out there. However, not all of that have been validated in science. And so one of the important uh, goals of research is to validate through science what are possible behavioral indicators of deception. Now, that doesn't mean that other indicators that are out there may not be deception indicators, but I do want to focus on uh, and we focus our work on what has been validated by science and vetted in the field, by the way, which is a different issue as well. 
Another important goal of, of the importance of research on deception indicators is to invalidate myths about behavioral indicators. So one, not only can research show us which indicators are indicative of de deception, but it's also one of the goals of research to show us what's not an indicator of deception so that we're not confused by those kinds of things uh, as we're out in the field doing our things. There are many, many consequences of research on deception indicators, as, as you all know in your areas. Um, organizations will develop policies around what is known and not known about behavioral indicators to inform their operators, whether they're law enforcement, other individuals in security, national uh, intelligence, loss prevention, uh, or anybody in, involved in, in credibility assessment. Organizations can create policies and the consequences of research on deception indicators can also inform training. So if you believe in a certain type of indicator that exists, you develop training around that or you acquire training around that. Likewise, if you thought that these other things over here were not reliable indicators of deception, then you wouldn't develop training on that. Of course, one of the major consequences of research is on application. You know, if we're, many of us are out there in the world doing credibility assessments, and, uh, and we would have our, our knowledge base and our skill base, of course, that informs how we're doing so. And so there's a large consequence of research on application. And then of course, public perception. I mentioned the thing about the, um, the, the, it, one, of the, the one of the goals of research is to know which, what, which kinds of behaviors are not indicative, indicative of deception. And I do wanna mention this one, which is, which, I, which is called the big myth out there. And the myth is that gaze aversion or not looking one in the eye is a sign of lying and or, you know, looking away when you're answering questions and whatnot. And actually that's not been found to be true in science, despite the fact that is, that is believed by people around the world in many different cultures. And you're seeing here on screen, a very small version uh, of the abstract from a study that was conducted a couple of, maybe two, two decades ago or so that surveyed people all around the world and what they thought were deception indicators. And it's true, many people around the world believe that looking away is a sign of lying. But there have been many studies that have tested that hypothesis and the vast, vast majority <clears throat> have not found support for that. And so for those of us in the research uh, community, uh, our position generally, if you talk to most people who, who know of this literature, the research literature will, will say that that's actually a myth and not, uh, not have been found in science. Now, what is true is that looking away has, has been found to be a reliable sign of mental searching or thinking, but not necessarily a fabrication. So there's an example of how research can invalidate uh, thoughts, hypotheses about specific behaviors about deception. I'd like to sp uh, spend a few minutes talking about early research on behavioral indicators of deception until, again, until 2000 or so. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, some of the roots of these, these thoughts that there's some behaviors that can be indicative of deception. Of course, one can look at uh, philosophers for thousands of years ago who, who have mentioned these kinds of things, but in modern day science, uh, the roots of these, the, the, the concept that be, there are behavioral indicators of deception starts with Darwin. And in Darwin's book, The Evolution, uh, The Expression of Emotion in Man and Animals, Darwin actually had what we call today the inhibition hypothesis, where Darwin stated that people are unable to perfectly simulate facial expressions in the absence of a genuine emotion and are unable to completely suppress their true emotions, <clears throat> sorry, true expressions when feeling strong emotions resulting in emotional leakage on the face and the body. <clears throat> so this was one of the theoretical roots of the notion that behaviors can betray one's words, that behaviors can then be indicative of something else than one is saying, because behaviors will leak out those alternative thoughts. And that's really kind of the root of of the thought that there are behavior, behavioral indicators of deception. So for decades, there were re really tons of studies 
that examined many different types of nonverbal behaviors and to examine whether those behaviors could be indicative of differentiating truth tellers from liars in many different situations. And about 20 years ago, not 2000, 20 years ago, DiPaolo and colleagues conducted a huge meta-analysis. And the meta-analysis is an analysis of previous studies. So while researchers conduct individual studies, a meta-analysis is a study of all the previous studies on a topic, which is an amazing amount of work. And Bella, uh, uh, Bella DiPaolo and, and colleagues conducted this meta-analysis at this time where they uh, aggregated all of the findings from most of the research on behavioral indicators of deception uh, published until that time. And to give you an example, if you can see the, the abstract here, they had estimates of 1,338 1, estimates of 158 cues to deception across, I, I don't even, I don't remember the number of articles, but it was, I mean, you can imagine it's a large number of research, published research articles in this area. So it's a huge amount of work. And, uh, and uh, my hat's off to them for, for conducting that meta-analysis because it, it was great to do so. One of the conclusions from this meta-analysis was that liars, it was, and despite the, the wealth of evidence, it was really interesting because the conclusions were not as strong or pervasive with regard to behavioral indicators as one would think. Uh, they concluded that liars appear more nervous than truth tellers with less facial pleasantness, higher vocal tension, higher vocal pitch, and greater, greater pupil dilation. So those were the cues that they found you know, sufficient evidence across all of the studies. And you can read some of the quotes from that article that are on this slide. And some of the uh, cues had had uh, you know, relatively large or moderately large effects, and some of them had smaller effects. But one of the things about this, this, uh, this uh, meta-analysis and the conclusion from the meta-analysis was the, the lack of support for many indicators. And so this, um, and, and I hear about that, that conclusion today, e even today, because many people point to this meta-analysis and its conclusions about the lack of evidence for many behavioral indicators about deception. And it's true. If you look at this meta-analysis and you look at these conclusions, it's true. However, you know, what we want to do is look, do a deep dive into exactly the details of what's going on in the meta-analysis and every single study. And my takeaway from that meta-analysis is again, sticking to the exact quality of the characteristics of the studies that were conducted is that few, if any, single indicators differentiated truth tellers from liars in low stakes lies or when suppressing emotions, feelings, or pain in contexts that may not involve interacting with others. So let me unpack this sentence a little bit, okay? Because I believe this conclusion is closer to the actual studies in the meta-analysis than a more generalized conclusion that, oh, there are no behavioral indicators. I hear that generalized conclusion about behavioral indicators a lot. But if one clearly examines the, the characteristics of the studies in the meta-analysis, first of them, most of the studies involve low-stake lies where there's no stakes involved, whether people are, whether and there's no consequences to whether one is caught or not, or whether, whether one is believed or not. And then there are many studies in the meta-analysis where a person is not interacting with anybody else and instead is, is instructed in an experiment to suppress their emotions or feelings or suppress their pain. And then they're video recorded. They're not interacting with others. And so in those situations where I, I agree with the findings of the meta-analysis, that is uh, and another, I'm sorry, there's another unpacking of the meta-analysis. Each of the, the nonverbal behaviors 
were analyzed by themselves. So does this, what I'm doing right now, does this action differentiate truth tellers and lies? Does this action differentiate truth teller, tellers and lies? And so I agree with the findings of the meta-analysis as in relation to the studies that were, that were in the meta-analysis. That is the conclusion I would draw is that few, if any, single behaviors differentiate truth tellers from liars in low stake lies or when people are by themselves suppressing their emotions, feelings, or pains. I agree with that. Where I differ with what I hear and sometimes read in contemporary, um, not research literature, but uh, other, other uh, lay literature out there is that there's no, with, I don't agree with the generalized statement that there's no behavioral indicators uh, that have been validated for lies because that's not what the findings from this meta-analysis say if one examines the actual studies that were in the meta-analysis. And again, my hat's off to DePaulo and colleagues for doing that meta-analysis. It was a huge amount of work. Regardless, there is a generalized thought about the conclusion from that meta-analysis, and that is that there's no, no behavioral indicators of deception. And as I mentioned earlier, there's consequences for, for doing research, right? And there, I've seen consequences with that generalized, and I think incorrect, conclusion from the, the, the meta-analysis. I've seen the consequences to policy. I've seen consequences like that to training and application by operators who are using this kind of information and public perception. And part of what I'm trying to do today in this webinar is to um, correct that perception, or at least give my side of what my conclusion from that, from that meta-analysis is. And like any science, people who interested people can go and look at the actual studies and, and can agree or not. But he, certainly I come up with a different conclusion rather than the generalized conclusion that I was mentioning. So let's take a moment and, and do a little deeper analysis of the uh, the, the Paul et al. 2003 meta-analysis. And I wanna focus on three specific areas um, that are most germane to how I understand this research literature and how we approach our work here at Human Tell. Um, the first area is gonna be on, uh, on the thought that the meta-analysis was limited in its sampling of studies of facial expressions of emotion. Second was that microexpressions were not yet studied or documented in an empirical peer reviewed journal. And thirdly, that the nonverbal behaviors in the meta-analysis were examined singly, that is by themselves, and not in combination or clusters with other nonverbal behavior and uh, nonverbal behaviors. So let's talk a little bit about uh, contemporary, contemporary research about those three particular issues. And the first issue has to do with uh, studies di directly examining facial emotions, uh, facial expressions of emotion as indicators. And so, I, you can see on the slide here, I listed Ekman, Friesen, and O'Sullivan in 1988, where they actually measured facial expressions of emotion. And I, I want to say, when, when one specifically examines studies where facial behaviors are measured and then classified into facial emotions, they have, and you've got a situation where people are telling the truth or lying with some relative stakes, those studies have always produced positive findings. Many of the non-findings in the meta-analysis is where facial, facial behaviors were not actually measured. And so there's other ways in which one can get facial data, but, uh, but when, and I don't wanna to get too technical, but whenever facial expressions of emotion were actually measured in the face in people who are telling the truth or lying, in situations where there's some degree of stakes, they've always produced positive findings. Ekman, Friesen, and O'Sullivan in 1988 was actually in the meta-analysis, and they were one of the few studies that produced a positive finding in the meta-analysis. So that's where you got the facial pleasantness conclusion in, in, uh, in, their, their, um, in the meta-analysis's conclusion. After that, Ekman et al. 1991 was actually included in the meta-analysis 
but not included on facial expressions. Because as you might remember, the meta-analysis was <clears throat> analyzing single cues. And so for whatever reason, they chose other cues in that particular article and not, not the ones on face, but the, in the article itself, there were actually positive findings on facial expressions of emotion. Since that time, you can see that there's some articles here from 2012 uh, where people, the, uh, people were in a situation where they're telling the truth, they're lying. There's huge stakes. I mean, one of those studies have to do with people who are pleading for, the, for, the, for, for their missing spouse to come back, right? And some of those were truth tellers and some of those are liars. And there, those researchers also actually measured the, the various emotions that can be portrayed in the face and, and differentiated truth tellers and liars very clearly. So my conclusion about this is that if you actually examine the studies that actually measured facial behavior and classified those measurements into facial emotions, and you've got a situation where truth tellers and liars, there's some stakes involved, those studies have always provided a positive finding about this. My second uh, uh, category that I'd like to talk about are studies of microexpression. Now, this is really interesting because um, as I mentioned earlier, microexpressions were never studied prior to the, to the meta-analysis, uh, uh, despite the fact that there's this common myth about that. I mean, we've known about microexpressions for decades before that, but um, I was going to say funningly, but you know, it's kind of interesting that despite the fact that microexpressions were well known for many decades, there was never a published article in the peer-reviewed journal that demonstrated that they differentiated truth tellers from liars. And that's true for before the meta-analysis. And I mentioned this because I hear today people say, oh, there's no evidence for microexpressions differentiating truth tellers from liars. And then they point to the meta-analysis. And, and of course, what I'm trying to say is that's, that's a logical, uh, that's not a logical conclusion because they were never published to be uh, studied prior to the meta-analysis. After the meta-analysis, they have been studied at least uh, in, 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 and being found in uh, peer-reviewed journals. Now, here's the other thing. In the first study to do that, which was the uh, Porter and Tenbrink 2008 study, they, they measured microexpressions and they, they concluded that they, were, they did not occur very often and they did not differentiate truth tellers from liars. So I also see people pointing to that article as well after the meta-analysis. The issue with that study in the 2012 study is that they studied micro, they, they measured microexpressions at 1 25th of a second. And to tell you the truth, I, I know that that statement has been around, but there's no basis by which expressions would have been seen at 1 25th of a second because First of all, current video is at 30 frames a second. And so 125th is less than one frame of a second. And back in the day, um, when we were studying these things, we were studying on film and film was recorded at 24 frames per second and you still wouldn't see them. So, I'm, so anyway, it was a technical impossibility to, uh, for, that I know of uh, that, that, that would not support such a claim about microexpressions. However, uh, you can see the studies in 2012 that actually study microexpressions at less than one fifth of a second. And when you study them at one fifth of a second, they then found that the microexpressions occurred, uh, occurred and they differentiated truth tellers and lies. And so there's a, several studies that did that. Later on, what we did was we actually surveyed microexpressions uh, that occurred in a, in a situation where there were stakes involved in truth tellers and liars, and we actually measured them at one tenth, one, uh, I'm sorry, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0.5 of a second. So we wanted to know when they started to actually occur and if they differentiated truth tellers from liars. The cutoff for us, for us is, is that one, one half of a second, because previous research has demonstrated that uh, normally occurring spontaneously, uh, spontaneously occurring facial expressions of emotion occur between a half a second and four or five seconds. So we know the cutoffs for what normally occurring spontaneous facial expressions are. The lower threshold of that is half a second. So we 
went below half a second and examined 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0.5 of a second, as well as beyond that as well, in truth tellers and liars. And what we found was you start to see these things at 0 0.3, okay? Um, and at 0.4 and 0.5, they're very different. They, they, they do a good job about differentiating truth tellers and liars. And so you can see on the right side here, a figure that demonstrates the, the micro expressions that occur in truth tellers, which is that line on the bottom and the liars, the line on the top. And here, which is, which is interesting that you see them in the same people for, compared to their own baseline. So that you see that liars are increasing in the truth in, in the micro expressions. As, as their line from baseline, uh, whereas the truth tellers actually go down. And so not only did we survey the micro expressions and, um, and uh, demonstrate that they differentiate truth tellers and liars, this is one of the very few studies that actually compare the, uh, be, their, the individual's behaviors to their own baseline. And as many of you operators out there know, baselines are incredibly important. And just a little, blurb about the study that I just mentioned. It happens to be one of the most uh, widely downloaded and uh, read and shared uh, studies on this particular journal. It's Frontiers in Psychology Journal. So what I'm trying to say about the microexpression is before the, the, the meta-analysis in 2003, they, they were never studied in a peer-reviewed journal. After that, when you study them correctly, you, they, they've actually differentiated the truth tellers and liars as the common thought of it was before the meta-analysis. It's just that there were no studies about that. And uh, finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about a multi, what we call a multimodal approach. And, and there's a lot of reasons why um, we believe that in order to understand behavioral indicators, we want to understand them in combination with each other, along with words, as what we call the total communication package. There's a lot of good reasons why we want to understand total communication packages instead of single things like just these words alone or just this behavior alone or just this behavior alone. We want to understand the totality of what's coming at us in communication. There's a lot of reasons, like I said, to, to do this. One is the fact that we're wired that way. Neurologically, we are wired to provide um, thoughts and feelings in a lot of modalities, both in verbally as well as non-verbally. And so the neural wiring of our bodies with our minds and the connection with cognitions and emotions is complex and comprehensive, which lends itself to understanding communication uh, behaviors as in their complexity. Secondly, there's a blending of cognitions and emotions. While psychologists and scientists like to separate cognitions and emotions. In reality, it's the big mush in our minds, right? In reality, they're occurring all, they're all, we have all kinds of thoughts and feelings occurring all the time. And so because of both of these reasons, I, what we want to try to do is to understand nonverbal behavior and words as part of the total communication package that's occurring in any interaction. And this is what I call the multimodal approach. Here, and think about this now, when we're in, in deceptive situations, um, many people, uh, whether we're in deceptive situations or not, sorry, most of us verbalize only a portion of our mental contents, right? There's so many things going on in our mind. We verbalize only a portion of our mental contents. And um, different mental states map, different mental states map onto different nonverbal channels. Uh, em emotions happen to go out into our faces. Um, other kinds of cognitions go out in our faces and our gestures and our body movements. Some other um, types of physiological arousal goes out in the rest of our body movements and our hands. So different mental states map onto different nonverbal channels. And so what that means is that whenever we're in interaction, especially if we're live, I don't want to talk too much about uh, remote communication, although it's there too. But especially when we're live, there are, there are many messages coming at us at any one particular time that are expressing many different parts of our minds. What we're, most people are only verbalizing only a portion of our mental context. Now, if we go back to the meta-analysis, um, remember the meta-analysis did its analysis and drew its conclusions on the analysis of single behaviors one at a time and whether that one behavior 
um, was differentiated truth telling and lying or not. And again, nothing wrong with that. You know, it's just that that's what they did. However, if we come to the question of communication, like I'm coming with a multimodal approach, as with everything that we're doing as part of a total communication package, we may want to look at combinations of behaviors. And in actuality, in the meta-analysis, there were studies that were used in the meta-analysis that combined the behaviors to see whether the combination of the behaviors differentiated truth tellers and liars. Here's three examples that are in the meta-analysis. And their findings actually demonstrated very well that the combination of behaviors differentiated truth tellers and liars. Again, the meta-analysis itself pulled out single behaviors and analyzed behaviors themselves, but there are actually studies in the meta-analysis that examined what we call clusters of nonverbal behavior together to see whether those clusters differentiated truth tellers and liars, and those differentiation rates were quite large. Since the time of that meta-analysis, there have been many studies that combine, that use a multimodal, multimodal approach that combine uh, uh, or analyze clusters or combinations of nonverbal behavior, sometimes with words and sometimes without, that always have, or that have produced find positive findings. That, that, that is that they show that the clusters or combinations of nonverbal behavior, sometimes with the words, do differentiate truth tellers and liars. And you can see here a partial listing of these studies over the last uh, two decades that have taken this approach. So there's a lot of evidence for the thought that clusters or combinations of behaviors, including words, can differentiate truth tellers and liars. Um, and here's some examples of uh, some findings from our own studies examining clusters or combinations of behaviors. Uh, and, and, you know, there's interesting findings here because different specific behaviors come out in different combinations with different types of questions, which is actually a really interesting thing. It speaks to the complexity of our thought, of our emotions and cognitions at, at any one particular time. We've shown that in that study, we showed that in this study, what is pretty consistent is the inconsistency in facial expressions of emotion that come around and certain types of gestures and certain types of linguistic and gra grammatical features of speech that differentiate truth tellers and liars. So I do believe that there are some consistent combinations of behaviors that do differentiate truth tellers and liars. There are some other behaviors that go one way or the other ac across studies. But the bottom line of all of this is that when you examine combinations of behaviors, they always differentiate truth tellers and liars better than, much better than uh, when you examine those behaviors individually. So what I'm suggesting <clears throat> is that the framework that I'm suggesting to you is that better explains what has been found in the research literature. It better explains what I think is actually going on in people's minds and how we are neurologically wired. Thus, examinations of single nonverbal behavior may sometimes lead to positive findings, but sometimes not, which is exactly what the meta-analysis reported. But examinations of clusters of nonverbal behavior should perform better, which is what the available studies have reported. And many studies that using that multimodal combinatorial approach have demonstrated that nonverbal behavior can differentiate truth tellers from liars fairly well. And in actuality, about eight years ago, there was a meta-analysis of nonverbal behavior clusters as deception indicators published. And this meta-analysis, again, published in 2014, concluded, this is a quote here, that um, the higher accuracy rates obtained here in their meta-analysis suggest that signals of deception are manifest in constellations rather than single cues. And so the research, available research, the, about that examined clusters of nonverbal behavior match with theory, match with the neurological wiring, match with what I think is common sense about the commu total communication package. And here's a meta-analysis that actually came to that same conclusion. 
And before I, I, I go off, uh, end the presentation, I do want to mention, uh, spend a few minutes talking about what is a deception indicator and what's an indicator, right? And here's how I and my colleagues uh, understand what an indicator is. It's a behavioral signal. It can be either verbal or nonverbal uh, of cognition or emotion that gives additional clues as to what an individual is thinking and feeling beyond the content of the words spoken. And uh, there are veracity indicators as well as deception indicators. I know I've been talking basically about deception indicators today, but there are veracity indicators as well. But the point I want to make is that every, every operator that I know that, that, that is worth their salt and everybody uh, in this field that actually uses indicators knows that there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between a veracity indicator in truth or a deception indicator in a lie. Um, these are signs that something else may be going on in the person's mind. And the indicators are very good at pointing out those times when that may be occurring. However, it then comes back to us as investigators, operators, people who are just talking and inter interacting with others, anybody who's out there doing credibility assessment to then probe further to find out why that indicator is occurring. Now, true, more often than not, the indicator may be or is likely to be a sign that led you to uncover deception. But sometimes that's not true. What it is, tr what is true is that the indicator is always a sign that there's something else going on and you might want to figure that out. And that's what we think of as indicators. So I'm often asked whether I think any one thing is a sign of deception. And I, I don't think that those exist. I do think that there are flag posts that go up that suggest, ah, oh, there's something right there. I might want to figure that out. And I think that's a healthier way to understand the behaviors that we're observing and then finding a way in which we can then uncover or discover uh, what's underneath that behavior. And that, that's what I think an indicator is. And I, I think that's a healthier way to understand what indicators are. Okay, moving to a conclusion here. Um, you know, I do want to mention that uh, we started talking about the meta-analysis and the amazing work that, that the, the, the authors of that meta-analysis did. I did mention my own understanding of that, the conclusions of the meta-analysis based upon the studies that were in the meta-analysis and how the meta-analysis was conducted. And I came away with a different take, right? As I mentioned that there are few, if any, single in, uh, behaviors that are indicative of truth tellers or liars in low stakes situations or when people are suppressing their emotions and feelings when no one else is around. When you examine studies, where there's higher stakes, when you actually measure facial expressions of emotion, when you actually measure them at high speeds in micro expressions, and when you measure behavior in combinations or clusters, there's abundant evidence, a wealth of evidence that those, uh, that those kinds of behaviors and that kind of examination uh, differentiate truth tellers and liars. And there's also evidence like you're seeing here that demonstrates that when people who, who make their living professionally uh, to do credibility assessments are trained on validated indicators, they do better at detecting lies later on. It's also true that when people, I mean, there's a lot of training research literature out there. And when you examine what's being trained, it's also true that when you examine studies that test unvalidated indicators, well, people don't do that much better after training because it's an unvalidated, unvalidated indicator. So um, it's something to think about when we're thinking about how to train people to be better at finding those indicators so that we can incorporate them in our interview strategies and be better investigators. Finally, I wanna just say, even though I've been spending all this time talking about uh, deception indicators, I happen to think the, the big benefit from reading nonverbal behavior is not just about deception, it's actually reading all of that total communication package. Because sometimes we can get information about what a person is thinking or feeling without them saying anything, right? And we can also get information that adds to whatever they're saying. 
And I just want to leave us with the thought here about the four functions of nonverbal behavior when people are talking. When people are talking, nonverbal behavior can complement the words, supplement the words, qualify those words, or contradict those words. And knowing those kinds of things gives us that additional insight into the personality and the motivations, the intentions about the individual, regardless of the, or in addition to the deception issue. And I think those kinds of insights are just as important, if not more important, in any kind of interview or interaction as veracity and deception indicators. Clearly, veracity and deception indicators are very important, but get, gathering these kinds of insights are also very important about nonverbal behavior. So I want to thank everybody for your kind attendance today at our webinar and for your great comments and thoughts about the work that we do. I'm going to stop here and uh, see whether there are any questions that anybody might have that we can address for the, for the few remaining minutes that we've got here during this, uh, this webinar. So I'm going to stop my slides here and turn it over back to our moderator. Thanks so much. Again, if you have a question, please insert it into the Q&A section, and we will try to get it answered <clears throat> in the short amount of time we have left. Um, there is a question regarding um, validated indicators, and someone asks, um, they're in loss prevention and conduct face-to-face -face interviews, and how would they go about learning these specific validated indicators you speak of? Oh, well, um, that the validated ind indicators are the ones that we uh, at Human Health uh, are based all of our work on. There are other sources of reading that one can get at, and I'm happy to provide those. Um, and I think we should provide some readings about that, and we will make sure that they are associated with this webinar. So one can read, one can, I mean, send us an email, we'll, we'll answer anybody who's out there. And take a look at the stuff that we train on, whether it's online or, you know, we've done a lot of work with in-person workshops with uh, people in loss prevention, and everything we train are on the validated indicators. It's, I do understand the, the, the source of the question. It's hard to find that information, right? Because there are so many sources out there and people out there talking about their, 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 their take on what the behavioral indicators are. And I see them a lot. Um, some of them have been validated in science and a lot of them hasn't. I don't think scientific validation is the end all be all for everything. I, as a scientist, I'll, I'll just say that. But I do think it's a good starting point, right? I think it's a great starting point. I think there's also a good place for experience that people have in the field that that uh, that should add to that. But I, so I think it's a combination of what's going on in the field and what's going on in the science. Uh, I'm starting to babble here, but yes, I, I will try to provide some of that re, uh, that resources and readings. Take a look at what the offerings that we have online, and for those of you who are interested in some of our uh, our in-person stuff, just contact us because everything we do is going to is is based upon. Our, uh, those validated indicators. Thank you. We have another question here about cultural differences. And this person asks, do cultural differences or interpreting an interview play any part in reading nonverbal behavior? Oh, <clears throat> well, that's a great question. I mean, yes. Uh, yes and no, actually, is the answer. It depends which nonverbal behavior one is examining. If we're examining micro expressions, there's no cultural differences in the in the form or the meaning of the micro expressions. Clearly, there's not. So you can read micro expressions with the confidence that no matter whom you're reading it in, they mean the same thing, which is one of the beauties of micro expressions, right? Um, when you're reading other kinds of spontaneous facial expressions of emotion, that's also true. You can read them with the confidence that you are, you're reading them and they have the same meaning and form everywhere. When you're reading non-spontaneous facial behavior and you're reading other kinds of gestures, there's a lot of cultural differences in those. And so um, it depends upon which, so as you can see, it depends upon which behavior one is reading and interpreting. Even in the gestures that are culturally different there's cultural cross-cultural similarities in why they're occurring. So their, their function in terms of cognition is the same, 
but the form of what you're seeing can be very different. And so it's it, so it gets a little tricky at that particular point. And I'm happy to go into more detail later on with anybody offline or send us an email or something like that, and we'll we'll take care of those. Thank you. This person has a question um, about the connection between cognitive dissonance and lying indicators or, or deception indicators. Um, and just to get your thoughts on that. Um, not exactly sure what the what the question is. Uh, <clears throat> I can tell you where my mind went to when I heard that. And that is, um, yeah, I, I can tell you that with regard to cognitive dissonance, depending upon how you, how you how one defines that, right? I think that there's a certain degree where truth tellers, both truth tellers and liars are going to have cognitive dissonance with regard to what's going on because because truth tellers also have the stress of be, wanting to be believed, especially when stakes are there. And again, I may not be answering the question with regard to cognitive dissonance as this uh, the individual who posed the question may be um, su in suggesting. Liars should have larger dissonance, however. And that's especially true when the liar is confronted with skillful questions. Because all of what we're talking about in terms of indicators, whether they're behavioral, uh, nonverbal, or verbal, they're all very largely dependent upon what's the questions being posed to the individual, right? Because I've been part of and I've seen many uh, interviews where <clears throat> when questions are on target, where, they're, where the person has to tell the truth or lie about a certain thing, then you see a lot of diff dissonance. However, there's, there's a lot of interviews that I've been part of and I've seen where um, you're talking to somebody who's actually lying about something, but when they're talking about something where they don't have to lie, they look very truthful. And so then the dissonance fades away. And so the dissonance will be differing, not only depending upon whether a person is telling the truth or lying, but also what they're being asked and what the dissonance is about. So I think dissonance exists in, in both truth tellers, in everybody, to, so, to some degree or to a large degree, but it's going to wax and wane depending upon the target of the question and the nature of those questions. And of course, the stakes that are involved. I hope I answered that question in the way it was, uh, was, was uh, intended. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Sure. Uh, this person asks uh, whether there is a difference in the marks of behavior of truth tellers or liars in the context of national characteristics or traditions in different countries or cultures. Oh. Well, I mean, the first thing I want to say about that is yes, um, but it has nothing to do, well, indirectly has to do with behavioral indicators. But what I want to say is that there's cultural differences in the meaning of lying, right? There's cultures out there where lying is positive uh, or lying itself does not have a negative connotation. And consequences, even if they occur, don't have that negative con connotation. And for that reason, uh, behavioral indicators will be very different. Uh, uh, to begin with, because when there's no consequences to any of this, and when lying is sanctioned, then there, you, then people are operating on a different plane, right? And so, yes, and those cu cultural slash national differences in the meaning of lying and meaning and the meaning of lying context exist, clearly exist. And so, yes, those have big uh, implications to behavioral indicators. There's also many cultural differences, of course, as I mentioned earlier, on the meaning of different types of, of nonverbal behavior. So while there's less different cultural differences on facial expressions of emotion, there are greater cultural differences on gestures and body movements and things like that. And so that picture gets complicated really quickly in terms of where, where, the, where the cultural differences exist and not in conjunction with the meaning of the lie that people have in their head, right? Uh, and of course, there's also the the complexity, the added complexity of who, who, who they're talking to and what, what the context is and, and what the physical setting, et cetera, et cetera. So I know I, know I just did a long-winded answer to that question, but the answer is yes, those, those cross-national cultural differences do exist and they should be taken into account. Having said that, that's one of the reasons why baselining individuals is critical, right? as many of you know who are out there in the field operating. 
Thanks so much. I think that um, we're going to wrap up and we thank everyone for joining today's webinar and hope you enjoyed it. As a reminder that everyone who's attended live will be entered to win a free course from Humantel. So please keep an eye out for a follow-up email that will be sent shortly. And Dr. Matsumoto, do you have any final words? Yes, I do. I, I Again, I wanna thank everybody for attending today in person or later on by listening I know everybody has a very, very busy schedule. For those of you who are out there who are professionals doing credibility assessments in uh, area law enforcement, security, intelligence, loss prevention, anything like that, um, thank you for whatever you're doing. And thank you, everybody, for being here to want to broaden our horizons. Hope it was helpful. I'll see you again the next time.